<laughs> so thank you guys for having me. It's a, it's an honor to speak to you guys, uh, especially during the holidays, uh, where we tend to make some poor decisions with what we eat. And so I always, my, my, my dad likes this joke. I'm a hepatologist. It's a horrible dad joke. But I'm here to help you guys, you know, uh, from a hepatology perspective. I'll be talking about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Here's just a quick outline. Um, so I'll talk about the definitions between NAFLD and non-alcoholic fatty liver and NASH and what these things mean. Um, then we'll go over some of the disease initiations and the um, predispositions that one can have genetically, and the behavior that drives the disease, and why we care about this, how it's becoming a big uh, impact on our transplants, as well as hepatocellular carcinoma incidence is increasing. And then we'll talk about who you should consider uh, working up and risk stratifying and even referring to hepatology. Um, in addition, we have some other analysis that we can do with non-invasive uh, scoring systems and vibration control transient elastography. That's our fibro scan. Uh, we also have MR elastography and, of course, an oldie but a goodie is our liver biopsy. Um, we'll go over some treatments, uh, weight loss, and some of the current clinical trials that have been published and some of the things we have available for our patients. So first of all, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is the umbrella. That's kind of everything. So steatosis seen on imaging or histology without significant alcohol use or any steatogenic medications. And the usual suspects for steatogenic medications are like steroids or amiodarone, tamoxifen. Um, and th there are some new guidelines that just came out in July for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I'll be referring to them a lot um, throughout my slides. So within this umbrella, you have fat, just the fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver. So it's greater than 5% hepatic steatosis without any evidence of hepatocellular injury, particularly in the form of hepatocyte ballooning. I'll show you some pictures of that. Then you have the more aggressive form, NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And again, that's just greater than 5% fat, but then you have some of that injury, the ballooning, the inflammation, and um, you can have varying degrees of fibrosis within NASH. So here at the top, you got a nice, beautiful, normal liver. And then, un unfortunately, here on the on the right is when you have steatosis in the liver, and it's about 25 to 30 percent of the general population, depending where you are. Um, they've done some studies looking at over 8 million patients, and um, the, the prevalence in the United States is more like 25 percent. In South America, it's 30 percent, and in the Middle East, has the highest prevalence of 31 percent. So um, why, why in South America and why in the Middle East? Well, the, the, it's, a, it's a good point you bring up. So some of it um, is genetic predisposition. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But it's also um, how your BMI, what, what do you think of obese, obesity with BMI? Because in, uh, particularly in Middle Easterners, uh, people from India, um, and also our Asian population, and you know, we, we see them in the clinic and their BMI is 27, we're like, well, that's not that big, but really that's, that's obese for that genetic population. We have to consider that and be very attuned to that. <coughs> okay, so it's, it's um, been well reported that um, you can see NASH with a BMI of 23 in, um, in Indians and also in Middle Easterners because the thresholds are different. And that has to do with how we carry our subcutaneous fat, bone density, and also muscle volume um, that we have to think about these things. So of, of this 25 to 30 percent, uh, 20 percent is um, 25 to 30 percent is just fatty liver, and then the, that's the whole umbrella. And then about a fifth of them, about three or six percent of the general population, have that more aggressive form, the steatohepatitis. And about a fifth of those guys progress to cirrhosis. And then so all these patients are at increased risk of cardiovascular death. About 40 percent um, will die of strokes or heart attacks. Um, there's increased uh, liver mortality and also hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, incidence is increased in this population. So the NAPLD activity score is something that we use more so in, in research and clinical trials to help quantify on a liver biopsy what's going on. Um, and so it, it's a grade. And the steatosis goes from 0 to 3. So less than 5% is a 0. And then uh, greater than 5% uh, to 33% is 1 and so on. And we just all you, by definition, all you have to have is a greater than 5%, we call it fatty liver. Um, and this is a 
picture of right here of a macrovesicular steatosis, so it's this large droplet steatosis. Um, it's not small droplet steatosis that you see intracellular. Um, that's more uh, mitochondrial dysfunction and typically a drug-induced liver injury. And then inflammation is just based on how many foci per high power field. There aren't any good um, ones on this slide. And ballooning is the, um, perhaps the most important feature. And when, they, when Kleiner, so Kleiner is a pathologist from the NIH, when he initially came up with this, he only graded it zero to two. So none, few, and many. Here's a picture of a ballooned hepatocyte right here in the middle. So you can see it has um, derangements in the cytokeratin. It's got the scallop edges, <coughs> these Mallory Dank bodies. So Kleiner just gave a talk a couple years ago at ASLB, it's our big liver meeting, um, and he was proposing that we increase the balloon grade from zero to two to zero to five because it's so important. Um, and it's typically underscored here. Um, and Pierre Bedosa is a, a pathologist out of uh, Paris. And he was looking at different algorithms on how to quantify, uh, based on the NAPLD activity score, whether it's that fatty liver or whether it's a more aggressive NASH. And you can see the steatosis, all you need is greater than 5%, so just a 1, right, or above. And then you really need some ballooning to call it NASH. You need a little bit of inflammation to call it NASH versus that fatty liver, okay? So that's why you can't just use a NAPLD activity score to say if it's NASH or not, because you could have a score of 5 with 3 in steatosis, um, 2 in inflammation, no ballooning, and it's really that's just fatty liver. That's not NASH. So it's like a gestalt based on pathology. So disease initiation. So here are some of those genetic predispositions that one can have that would increase their risk. So PNPLA3 um, is a triglycerol lipase, and the, um, the, por the portion of uh, populations that have this mutation vary, um, and the Hispanic population has the highest incidence at about 30%, but it's not something we routinely check for. It's more for um, clinical trials. It's not a, a simple lab test that we can draw here. TM6SF is transmembrane 6 superfamily 2. Um, and that has to do with VLDL transport out of the liver. So they have trouble getting fat out of the liver, and that causes um, <laughs> the mutations there. But just because you have one of these mutations doesn't mean you're going to get mass. It just lowers your threshold. You still have to have some kind of disease initiator, whether it be the bad behavior and increasing um, body weight, uh, or it could be from other causes, drugs, TPN, um, jejunal, ileal bypass, genetic disorders, or systemic uh, inflammation. And behavior is the most important aspect of, of this disease state. And it's an increased weight gain due to dietary excess is really what drives this. It's really related to obesity. And it's hard. It's easier said than done to lose weight. As many of you know, it's easy to tell the patient to lose weight. Um, but uh, I always tell my residents or fellows or whoever I'm with, don't tell the patient just to lose weight. And especially don't say that as they're walking out the door. It's the worst thing you can say, right? They know they need to lose weight. So I always initiate it by asking them, what are you doing to lose weight? Um, and I also will um, tell them to use their smartphones and just take a picture of everything they're eating as a food diary and then to calculate the calories at the end of the day and just work on caloric restriction that way. But sometimes this is a coping mechanism. It's how they're dealing with stress. Um, and there's binge eating um, behaviors and other um, behaviors that could be addressed by psychologists. So I'll often refer them to a clinical psychology if they're needed. Okay. So it's 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 linked to all of the components of the metabolic syndrome, but obesity is the biggest driver. Okay. So like someone who is obese but who does not have diabetes and has hypertriglyceridemia and has high blood pressure is a very at risk of having NASH. They've actually done those studies where they went and looked at the NASH Clinical Research Network, looked at the biopsies, looked at all features of the metabolic syndrome, and especially in non-diabetics. The more features of the metabolic syndrome you have, the more likely you are to have NASH. So there's five components, and if you had four out of the five not having the diabetes, there's an 80% chance that you have NASH, based on um, all the biop on biopsy data. But obesity is the main driver, the main driver. So the pathogenesis, is it's, so you, can have, you can have this genetic predisposition, then you can have the disease initiator, which is typically the behavior, which leads to a phenotype. 
and you have things that are pushing um, the, the, the phenotype further in the bad direction, so behavior, um, the gut and the microbiome. So people are looking at toll-like receptor 4 and LPS expression, endotoxemia as drivers, um, metabolic um, perturbations, inflammatory, adaptotic, and fibrotic pathways, all of which are being targeted with drugs and clinical trials. But these are the perpetuating mechanisms. But the liver is a very forgiving organ. Um, and so there's, there are restorative mechanisms that are always going on as well. So you have stem cell activation, regeneration of the liver, uh, cell matrix crosstalk, improvement in microcirculation, and metabolic reprogramming that are causing restorative measures. So it's really about that balance. You know, which one is kind of winning, the progression or the restoration as to whether the patient is stable, whether the patient is uh, progressing in their disease or, or regressing in their disease. And, and, and to, your, to your point, that um, if a patient is, tends to get, is gaining a lot more weight, then I get more worried um, that their uh, disease is getting uh, significantly worse. And I was just telling Andrew earlier, so I had a, a patient uh, when I was a fella. Uh, she was 19. She had elevated LFTs. And during her first year of college, she gained 50 pounds. And so we were worried about her. She was referred to us by peds. We biopsied her. And she had bridging fibrosis from NASH at age 19. So that was the, the one factor we were really worried about was that significant weight gain. And there are other conditions associated. But number one is obesity. Um, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, the metabolic syndrome. We've, we consider this the liver manifestation of the metabolic syndrome. It's, it's intimately linked. Polycystic ovarian syndrome because it has many features of so the metabolic syndrome is associated. And other conditions that are associated with NAPHLA but less uh, studied are hypothyroidism, obstructive sleep apnea, hypogonadism, hypopituitarism, and pancreatic duodenal resection and psoriasis. And the pan pancreatic du duodenal resection has to do with bile acid availability and FXR agonism um, through bile acids. We're realizing that bile acids do a lot more um, than break things down. They're, they're actually nutrient molecules. Um, with, with the with significant feedback loops. So the impact is these. Why, why do we care? So this is a, a look at, if you look at the green bars, there's a number of transplants that have occurred from 2003 to 2014. You can see it's, it's fairly static. It's around the five, 6,000 range. And then the, the, if you look at uh, the y-axis here, this is the number of transplants per etiology. So hep C is still winning. Um, but with all these great new drugs out, we're, we're hoping to see that uh, decline. You can see um, NASH is significantly on the rise, as well as alcohol disease. Uh, alcohol is always around. Um, and you can see these dramatic increases more from 2008 to 2014. And interestingly, we're seeing less transplantation for cryptogenic cirrhosis because we, um, we're realizing that a lot of those things we thought were cryptogenic were just NASH. And this is a, a study my co-fellow did when I was at VCU. And, you know, where we keep talking about this, it's going to switch over where hep C is not going to be the leading cause. It's going to be NASH. Well, we're already starting to see that. If you look at um, patients who are less than 50 years old, this is just looking at the um, indications for transplant in patients in the 2015 registry. And you can see NASH and cryptogenic are already winning. Cryptogenic is a very small portion of transplants. Um, it's already beating hep C. And you can see the, the, uh, the changes over here. So it's, it's already here. And then this is from the Sears database. While we're doing a fantastic job um, improving the incidence of certain cancers, uh, you know, thank you for reducing uh, colon cancer, endoscopy, et cetera, um, liver cancer is on the rise. And it's not just here in the United States. It's world, worldwide. Um, it's, I believe, the third leading cause of cancer-related mortality in the world at this point. So... And then we suspect that number to increase even more dramatically here in the United States with the obesity epidemic and the increasing prevalence of NASH. So who to refer? Can I, can I get a little help? So there, there are three streams kind of to think about patients. And the first one is elevated liver chemistries. Some people get surprised when I put this slide up here, but the normal ALT, upper limit of normal for ALT for a male is actually 30, and for a female it's 19. The reason why it was so much higher is because they didn't know what hep C was when they came up with the normals um, back in the 60s. And our epic range is better than most EMRs I've seen. It goes up to 45, still not good enough. Um, but I also uh, do work at uh, Mount Sinai West and at St. Luke's. They use ECW, the upper limit of normal there is 69. 
So you can imagine that people have patients with epilepsy that are normal. You know, that their patient uh, ALT is 70, and it's a female, and they're like, it's not that much higher. But real, realistically, it's almost like four times the upper limit of normal. It's pretty daggone high. Um, and th this is just to point out that, you know, if you have a patient who had imaging that showed fatty liver and they have an increase in ALT, they're very likely to have NASH. They should absolutely be worked up to NASH. That's kind of one stream is the elevated liver chemistries. Here's the uh, laundry list workup that I have to do for elevated liver chemistries. And, and I do it for everybody because if you don't look, you don't know. And I've, I personally had a patient who had four separate liver diseases going on. Um, and, I, and I told my attending about it. I was, just, I was so, like, impressed. And he said, well, he had one that had five. And if you don't know, if you don't look, you don't know. Um, and the reason I'm checking hep A status is not because that's what's causing the liver disease. because I need to vaccinate them for hep A and um, check their hep B status and vaccinate them for hep B. But you can see, oh, pardon me. You need to work them up for hereditary hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, and autoimmune. Um, nowadays, when we biopsy folks, it's often whatever disease plus fatty liver. So I biopsied somebody a couple weeks ago who had autoimmune hepatitis and with known autoimmune hepatitis, and she started having an increase in her LFTs. She was actually an Asian female with a BMI of 25. Um, and I, I biopsied her, and she had NASH plus autoimmune hepatitis. Um, and then, my, very you know, importantly, I need to take a history. How much alcohol are they using? You know, is this alcoholic liver disease or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I look for those, those typical medications, methotrexate, tamoxifen, steroids, and amiodarone. I do routine blood work, and also um, consider vibration control with transendlastography. That's the fiber scan. I'll go into that in more detail. MR elastography and a liver biopsy if needed. So fatty liver on imaging. I'll admit, when I was a resident at uh, Kings County with, with Peter, I teed all the time, and I wouldn't do anything about it. I thought it was kind of normal, and I didn't think there was anything to do. Um, and I realized I was totally wrong. Um, so, if, and this is by our new guidelines. So, if you see incidental hepatic uh, steatosis on imaging, then you have to go to you know, the next step in the algorithm. Do they have abnormal LFTs? And if so, then you need to work them up for non alcoholic fat liver disease. If not, then we'll look for features of the metabolic syndrome. Um, and if they do have features, then they should also be worked up for non alcoholic fatty liver disease because, as I talked about earlier, the more features of the metabolic syndrome you have, the more likely you are to have NASH. And you can have NASH and totally normal ALT. That happens in about 25% of patients. And if it's a no no, then you need to look to see if they're drinking alcohol or if there are any of those medications that can cause a fatty liver. So in particular, um, the ASLD made a comment about diabetic patients. And so they're at increased risk for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And they suggested risk stratification um, based on the fibrosis level uh, using clinical decision tools and non-invasive scoring systems like the NAPL fibrosis score, the FIB4 score, or the fiber scan. Um, and then to consider doing an MR elastography if you have it available to you. So, I'm going to explain to you why we care about fibrosis. So the fibrosis pattern in, in NASH is a little bit different than uh, like hep C, for example. So it starts, you know, F0 is no fibrosis, and F1 is a sinusoidal or pericellular fibrosis. It's a chicken wire fibrosis on staining. And then F2 is the periportal plus the sinusoidal. F3 is bridging, and F4 is cirrhosis of the liver. So this is why I care. So the, this is a, a study done by UNESCO et al., and he looked at liver-related mortality over time based on fibrosis. You can see the cirrhotics, they do poorly, they die. Um, F3 will also do poorly and die. And then this has been shown um, in this, this is the best longitudinal study we have, and it's a mixture of patients from North America, Asia, and South America as well. It's about 700 patients, if I recall. And they looked at kind of all of the histological features, uh, features, um, other medical problems that they had. And the only thing that really came out was, again, the fibrosis staging. So the more likely that you have, the, the more fibrosis you have, the poorer you do. Um, age was also, also came out, we know age is related to fibrosis, diabetes, and smoking. Statins were actually protective, okay? And so, you know, as a hepatologist, I will often calculate the AHA risk stratifier to see if a patient needs to go on a statin. Um, and I remember we used to always check the hepatic panel on people when we started a statin, but we don't do that anymore. 
Um, however, some providers are still uncomfortable starting a statin when the ALT or ASC are elevated. I'm happy to do it um, because, because I have this data to show. And it's not just working on HMG CoA reductase. It's actually helping with the fibrosis in the liver. It changes the microenvironment of the liver itself. And we know we use it for inflammation, right, after a stroke. Um, so statins are very helpful. There's no randomized trials of statin use for NASH? No, not, not, nothing good yet. Um, but there, there's some work that's ongoing for that. Um, but, and the, the antifibrotic um, component of it is still being studied to actually under, uh, to tease out that mechanism. So any uh, uh, LFT abnormality level is not use the statin or just? I, I pretty much use it. I mean, so for an apple, typically their ALTs aren't that high, okay? If the ALT is greater than 200, I start thinking about other things because it's, it's probably something else at that point. Um, and then there's also this concept of um, adaptation to medications um, when you start, <laughs> when, um, if you have increases in ALT and ASD. And it, as long as it's less than, uh, goes up less than five times the upper limit of normal and you watch it, oftentimes it'll normalize in a few months. So just keep an eye on it, to be honest with you. But I have a lot of data to support that it, it's a, there's a mortality benefit. So I'm very quick to put patients on statin. Most of the time they're already on one, but if they're not on one, I'll, I'll, I'll re-stratify them to put, try to put them on one. Um, some people are hesitant because of because uh, of the muscle pain that they can occur. That can occur. So I typically will start low and go up as tolerated. So this was a study by uh, Min et al. He, um, and he was out of VCU. And he was interested in uh, looking at the cholesterol metabolism in our NAFLD patients. And, and its implications for atherosclerosis, because I mentioned to you earlier that these patients are all dying from strokes and heart attacks uh, for the most part. So in NAFL, um, there's actually uh, increases in HMG-CoA uh, reductase, um, and there's also increases in SREBP2, which is the regulator of that enzyme. There's more free cholesterol available, which gets put out in the circulation as VLDL, and L then breaks down to LDL, and there's I actually a decrease in LDL receptors. If there's more LDL out there, more free cholesterol out there causing plaques, okay? So this is kind of the mechanism um, that, that's, that's driving the atherosclerosis in these NAFLD patients. So I'm gonna jump back to those non-invasive scoring mechanisms, or uh, systems that we talked about. So there's several out there, but the ASLD just endorses the top two, the NAFLD fibrosis score and the FIT4 score. So this is something you can just Google and then plug in the numbers. Um, but I will caution you, the albumin is in grams per liter, okay? It's ours are typically in grams per deciliter, so you gotta shift your decimal over. So, so that would be 3.4 in our system, but it's 34 here. And we can go through it. So this is a 62-year-old gentleman, BMI of 33, who has diabetes, AST is 30, ALT is 60, so not terribly elevated, but we know that's actually twice the upper limit of normal. Platelets are on the slightly on the lower side, 175. Albumin is 3.4, so not terribly low. And the score puts out 0 0.827. So if you look here, it's actually, the it, numbers are kind of funny here, it uses minus numbers, but greater than 0 0.675 is a predictor of uh, potential uh, significant fibrosis, so F3, F4 fibrosis on this patient. So that would more of a workup. Um, and we are working with Epic to have uh, universal doc phrases so that all you have to do is type in like dot um, NAFL fibrosis score, it's been along those lines, and it'll spit out a number for you, and it'll tell you what it means and who to refer. So we're, we're actively working on that now. So FIB4 is another calculator. Um, this was initially developed by Richard Sterling out of VC. He's one of my mentors. I have to give a shout out to him because he introduced me to my wife. Um, <laughs> and so he, he's, he's very interested in HIV and hepatitis C co-infection. That's what he developed this um, equation for. Uh, but Shaw et al., um, who uh, with Samuel out of VCU, um, used this fibrosis scoring uh, equation for fatty liver, and the cutoffs are a little different. Okay, so that's, I, I, ca I caution you if you try to use this online, don't use the cutoffs that are there on the bottom of the screen because those are for um, co infection and not for fatty liver disease. And we know that co infected patients typically have um, more fibrosis, and we have to think about them a little bit differently. And I put a, you know, to me, well, it's an obvious cirrhotic. So 65-year-old, again, age is very dependent on fibrosis. 
ASC is 45, ALT is 30. So whenever the AST gets greater than the ALT, I get worried about cirrhosis. But platelets are really the one um, what I get very worried about because that's an um, indirect marker of a uh, marker of oral hypertension, so that they have hypersplenism, increased um, thrombopoietin production of the liver, and that's what's driving the thrombocytopenia. And so this patient comes out with a rip-roaring score of 3.56, um, which is greater than 2.67, so very likely to have um, advanced uh, fibrosis in their liver. So vibration-controlled uh, transalloxography, this is the fiber scan. This is one Doug was telling you about. If you remember, he was joking around. The French developed this to figure out if the cheese was done uh, in the center, and then they started using it on, uh, on livers. And we did this in the clinic. It takes less than five minutes to do. We get a, um, it uploads the scores for us immediately, and we can um, tell the patient the results right away. Um, and we have this available at all of our clinical sites. I have a portable one that I take over to the diabetes clinic every Friday afternoon and use. But it spits out two scores for us. So the most important is the liver stiffness measurement, so that's the fibrosis score, because I want to risk stratify them. You know, is this patient an F0, F1, or does this patient have cirrhosis? And then the next score it puts out for me is a steatosis score so that I can see what's the etiology. Is this fat likely fatty liver or not? We have two separate probes. You have the M probe. Um, so all the probes, that literally just goes every liver and just taps it like that. Just 10 quick taps. Um, and the M probe looks at a measurement 2.5 to 6.5 centimeters below the, the skin. So it's a 4 centimeter long vector. And uh, because in the United States, uh, we've had issues with the M probe because of obesity, we have to make the XL probe, the French joke round, and call it the American probe. And that just looks a little bit deeper. It looks another centimeter deeper. Um, because if you catch too much of the septicaneous tissue, it's not an accurate read. It's not a good read. But we can tell when we're doing our scans. And this is just to show you that not all disease uh, states are, are the same when you use a fibrous scan. We have different cutoffs that we have to use. Um, and uh, as you can see, Hep C and HIV co-infection is on the higher side, and MAFLD is actually on the higher side as well. Um, alcohol is even higher. But this is a quick way for me to, so it'll spit out a number of like 9.9, .9. and then so I know that it's an F2 patient, but kind of a budding, um, bridging fibrosis. So then I get very worried about that patient, and I often will do a biopsy on that. And so the cap is a, um, this is a uh, gives us an idea of the amount of steatosis in the liver. So they did, um, this is a, the XL probe is relatively new compared to the M probe. This technology has been around for over 10 years, I believe, but which is FDA approved in the United States in 2014. Um, so the French are kind of ahead of us, and they did this nice study um, earlier this year where they were using the XL probe. They used the probe on a patient, marked the spot, and the patient went straight for liver biopsy in the same spot, just to show how reliable it was. Um, they did about two to three hundred patients, and they saw that it was, it was quite reliable, and these were the numbers that they used um, for the cutoffs. And again, I just care that if it's greater than 5%, because if it's greater than 5%, then that's fatty liver by definition. Okay, and then the question is, how much scarring is there? Um, and then is, is this a simple fatty liver, or is this a NASH case? MR elastography is the newest kid on the block. Um, it was first really studied in, in 2011, and so you have uh, the regular MRI pictures here, and then this is the, um, gives you an idea of the, the amount of fibrosis. So instead of like a little tap, this is a gigantic paddle that goes over the liver and it bumps the whole liver. So you're looking at the, the fibrosis of the entire liver. And we have, um, most centers are lucky to have one, we have four. Um, and not only... Um, so can you quantify the amount of scarring? But there is this PDFF, so that's a proton density fat fraction that can um, help estimate the amount of fat in the liver. And this actually only takes another four seconds to do while they're doing the MR elastography. It's, it's a pretty neat technology. And you can do, these are just representative pictures. This is um, the newer generation of MR elastography where they'll actually outline the liver and they'll quantify the amount of scarring in the liver. Um, and you may note that uh, the numbers are a little, little different compared to the fibrous scan, and that's because they're using Young's modulus here. So if you're a physics person, it's a, a different modality. That's why the numbers are a little different. But if you want to convert from uh, MRE to fibrous scan, you multiply by two and a half. <coughs> so they did this really nice study in San Diego where they just went to a diabetes clinic. 
they, they pulled the first 100 patients that came there with diabetes and said, hey, do you want an MRE? We'll give you an MRE. 98 of them said, sure. And when they screened them, so using the, the fat fraction greater than 5%, just showing that you have fatty liver, 65% of those patients had fatty liver, okay? And then this equates to, again, multiplied by 2.5, so 10. So that's a F3 or F4 fibrosis, so advanced fibrosis. 7.1%, so, so seven of those 98 patients had advanced fibrosis. None of them knew they had liver disease at all. Um, so it's a little scary to think, you know, I tell the patients all the time, it's not like you hit your hand and it hurts. The liver doesn't tell you what's going on, unless you're, you know, you're very in tune, tuned into the labs. Um, the only time it starts to tell you is when they're, sort of, frankly, cirrhotic, when they're having ascites and hepatic encephalopathy or GI bleeds, because the most common uh, symptom is fatigue. And who's not fatigued at some point? It's really hard to quantify. So there's still a role for liver biopsies. I do my own liver biopsies. Um, I do them percutaneously here at KCC4. Um, it, it's still here. Um, I need to do it to make sure there's nothing else going on. Um, and also to quantify the amount of fibrosis and to rule out other diseases. And, uh, you know, a lot of so a lot of times you'll have these um, fatty liver patients, and if you draw the ferritin on them, the ferritin is elevated. And it's not that they have iron overload. It actually works through inflammatory markers. So if you have increased IL-6 through inflammation, it actually down-regulates hepcidin, which is made by the liver. Hepcidin um, regulates ferropoietin in the duodenum, which controls iron absorption. Okay? So... The way it works is you have negative, negative, um, and then the ferropotent just keeps on absorbing. So it's not that these patients have hereditary hemochromatosis. They're just absorbing more iron because there's increased inflammation going on. But the biopsy will often tell me that. And um, also the iron studies with uh, trans uh, ferritin saturation will kind of clue me into that. So here's um, an algorithm that's uh, been proposed. So if you have a patient who has hepatic steatosis on imaging and elevated serum ALT, um, you want to make sure they're not drinking a ton of alcohol and uh, exclude other causes of uh, elevated LFTs. And then, so that confirms the diagnosis of fatty liver. And then we can stratify them further. So if you have a patient who is on the younger side, um, BMI, again, depending on ethnicity, you have to always be mindful of that here in New York, um, that the BMI cutoffs are different for different ethnic groups. And if they don't have features of the metabolic syndrome and their scores are on the lower side, this isn't somebody I'm going to rush to biopsy because um, I don't have much to offer them, to be quite honest. But I don't want to lose sight of them because they may gain a ton of weight and then kind of flip over to a, a more aggressive form. So it's somebody I will often see just once a year. Then you have a little bit more worrisome. So BMI is elevated. Their age is a little older. And then when you put them in these scoring systems, they're like in that indeterminate range or there's a little bit of fibrosis. These are people I'll often do a liver biopsy on to really understand what's going on. And then you have patients who are like basically cirrhotic, right? Low platelets, AST is greater than ALT. Um, the fiber scan scores are quite high. So these are patients I need to either biopsy or do an MR elastography on to figure out what's, what's uh, the truth in that. So treatments, there's no FDA approved drug, but we know the weight loss works. There have been several, several studies looking at weight loss. The best one is actually out of Cuba. It came out a couple of years ago. Um, and what they did was they just did liver biopsies on patients at baseline, found out that they had NASH. Then they asked them to do caloric restriction, just three to 500 calories per day, and to just increase their amount of walking. So nothing too crazy. They found at the end of the year that those who lost 3% or greater could, could resolve the steatosis. The ones who lost 5% or greater could resolve the ballooning or the inflammation in the steatosis. And those who could, could achieve 7% weight reduction in that year could actually have resolution of NASH. So they flipped over from NASH to just the fatty liver, which is great. And this is what's amazing. The liver is so forgiving. So if you can lose 10% of body weight or more, you can actually reverse fibrosis in a year. So this is something I use. I tell every one of my patients this to try to empower them as a tool. Like, hey, this weight loss is going to help your liver. It's going to help your diabetes, it's going to help your hypertension, it's going to make you feel better, it's going to help your joints. Um, and, and, and then I break it down month to month. All right, what's your weight? Let's figure out 10%. Let's break it down month to month. You typically, it's like two or three pounds. It's not, it's not a terrible amount of weight that you're asking for. 
when you break it down that way, it, it, it's typically more realistic and achievable by the patient. Look how I can do that. Two pounds a month, I can pull that off. So, again, no FDA-approved drugs. Um, there have been some studies that have come out that show some efficacy of certain medications, but none of them are approved because there's issues with those medications. And there have been um, other clinical trials with um, on other agents that aren't, aren't so promising, but we'll go over some of them. So the Pivens is the first trial. This is uh, my mentor at VCU. He published this one in the New England Journal. So this is the Pivens trial. So this is through the National Clinical Research Network. And they looked at 247 non-diabetic patients who they knew had NASH. And they put some on pioglitazone, some on vitamin E, and then some on placebo for 96 weeks, and they pre biopsy them. They were looking at improvements in the ballooning, um, no increase in fibrosis, neither a decrease in that NAPLD activity score um, without worsening of fibrosis, okay? And they wanted to show improvements in that steatosis inflammation as well. This is what came out of it. So histological improvement overall, vitamin E, 43%, theoglitazone, 34%, placebo, 20%. Resolution of definite NASH, or resolution of NASH to go to fatty liver. 20% in the, again in the placebos, 36% <laughs> vitamin E, 47% in pioglitazone. And pioglitazone is kind of falling out of favor because there's weight gain associated with this medication, and we know that weight gain isn't good in this population. So nobody's really prescribing pioglitazone these days, or pioglitazone if you like to say it that way. Vitamin E, there have been some studies out there to suggest that maybe it causes the um, increased uh, risk of prostate cancer and increases in um, hemorrhagic strokes and all cause mortality. And the study was done in um, RRR alpha tocopherol vitamin E. Um, so we don't know what happens when you have other form formulations of vitamin E. I've gone to the to the store and looked, and you get all kinds of weird stuff. Um, so I, I, you know, you can consider it, but. Um, I don't think it's ready for prime time. I'd rather try to get them in other trials. So FXR agonism, so this is a, um, a nuclear receptor for bile acids, um, FXR, and through several different mechanisms. So you can see it actually activates small heterodyne partner, um, which inhibits SRABP1C, which ultimately leads to decrease in plasma triglycerides, okay? And there's other modalities where it's increasing lipo protein lipase activity, increasing triglyceride clearance, and through um, the scavenger receptor as well, it actually um, causes HDL clearance, okay? So it's, it's decreasing HDL. So we knew all this kind of before going into the study. So beta-cholic acid was the first FXR agonist used, and it's a derivative of ketodeoxycholic acid um, with uh, 40 times the affinity for the FXR receptor. And so they did this, uh, this nice study. This is a phase 2B done again by the NASH Clinical Research Network where they gave patients a beta-cholic acid for 72 weeks or they gave them placebo. And again, when the drugs work, they really only work about 40% of the time. Then the placebo, they work about 20% of the time, okay? All of our studies, the placebos work about 20% of the time. Um, and I, I call this the dentist effect. Before I go to the dentist, I tend to brush the hell out of my teeth. I don't know about you guys. So this is the same thing, increased access to healthcare. Patients tend to take more responsibility and try to do better. Um, that's what we think is really going on. But some of the, the drawbacks of this medication where there's, there's, there's some bad puritis um, that typically responded to medication, decrease in HDL and an increase in LDL. We could tell it was on the medication because all their LDLs went up. Um, but they typically responded to statins when we put them on statins. So it wasn't, it wasn't that difficult to manage and we know the statins will help patients in the long run anyhow. But decreasing the HDL and the LDL didn't correspond with any like, um, outcomes? No, so, no. The, so the, just because the, it's, 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 yeah, because it's, we don't know yet, um, to be honest. So they're doing phase three trials now, and they didn't look to see if it was the small, dense LDL or what fraction of LDL it really was, because not all LDL is created equally. Um, but there, there weren't any um, adverse reactions as far as, uh, you know, that the, they could see in that 72-week study. Um, they're doing Regenerate 3 now. So uh, Regenerate, which is the Phase 3 um, version of this trial. And to get past some of those obstacles, they try to lower, they're trying to lower dose as well at 10 milligrams. 
but you can see it's a six year long study. This is going to take a long time to really understand what's, what's going to come out of it. Um, but I will say that the interim analysis for the phase two trial, they already had um, a difference and so they shortened the study. So they're hoping that this will shorten the study too. But some of the downsides is, you know, the patient in the six year long study wound up having four liver biopsies. Not very exciting for the patient, especially if you're on placebo. Um, but then again, 20% of people are going to respond um, on placebo. So it's, it's, you know, the jury's still out. But there are several other companies who have developed FXR um, agonism molecules um, that, that they're hoping won't have that bad profile. So liraglutide, I like the GLP-1 drugs. Um, this is the first phase two trial using those, those molecules. Um, oh, those compounds, sorry. And they showed, again, um, so they had some diabetics in this, in this trial. Uh, there were eight in the liraglutide group and uh, eight or nine in the, in the placebo group. So resolution of NASH was greater with the liraglutide, and some of these patients were diabetic. I think three of the nine were diabetic, and um, zero of these two responded on placebo were diabetic, okay? Um, it, it did help with, them, uh, with ballooning, but didn't really do much for um, inflammation, and it didn't make fibrosis get worse, okay? So it's, it's acting on one of the mechanisms here. And they're, they're doing um, phase uh, three clinical trials with a similar mo molecule now. Semiglutide is one of the compounds that they're using, um, which uh, it's, it's fewer injections. I think it's once a week with semiglutide. But there's tons of clinical trials that are ongoing. Um, and we have, um, I think, six or seven that are ongoing now. And we're going to have four or five um, come online in the next couple months. Um, and so we're actively re recruiting and um, all spectrums of fibrosis from F1 to cirrhosis. It's, it was exciting to finally have some cirrhotic uh, studies, which uh, this year, that, that was kind of new to the field. So this is just to give you an idea of the landscape. So there's over 122 clinical trials for NASH in the United States right now. This is from clinicaltrials.gov, and they're kind of going on everywhere. Because this is um, this is the disease of the ages. So this is a real life experience. I've been going to a diabetes clinic and fiber scanning diabetics who are willing to have a fiber scan. And um, so uh, this is like a, an earlier slide. So initially, I had just done 32 patients. Um, 26 of them had fatty liver just by um, using the CAP score, and 10 percent, or sorry, 10 of the 32. Um, had some significant fibrosis as per the fiber skin. It's about 30%. And the number has been varying um, between 70 and 80% in the diabetic population. I've also started teaming up with um, Mount Sinai St. Luke's has this great weight loss program. Uh, they have a 15 year track record. The average BMI is 43. It's a year long kind of group therapy. Um, and they uh, have 9% weight loss at the end of that year. And so I've been teaming up with him. So a lot of his, and so Rich Weil is the person who runs that. And he, and he told me when I first met him, he's like, you know, all these patients are metabolically lean. He's like, I'm shocked. You know, if you just look at their blood profiles, you wouldn't think their BMIs were like 43 to 45. He's like, I haven't been able to find anything there. And so we started fiber scanning them. And we noticed that they, they're all, like 72% of them had fat in their liver and have fatty liver. And 18% had some significant fibrosis. And so we're, we're planning on, um, I just wrote up a proposal to study this population because they have that weight loss um, to characterize them a little bit better and to use utilize some of the tools we have here like MR elastography to try to understand with a known intervention what's going on in a shorter period of time because um, most of these patients lose 70% uh, of their weight by six months. So instead of like going on to a year, if I can characterize things in a shorter time frame, maybe we have better understanding and hopefully our studies won't have to go out to five or six years. Maybe we can kind of shrink the time course. So that's uh, something I'm actively proposing. So what's new? Um, in the EMR, there's now a referral for FibroScan. So you can uh, put off a referral. It's still pretty new. We're, uh, we're, we're kind of beta testing it. So if you do it and you have any difficulties, contact me and I'll, I'll fix the problem. I promise. I'm going to work on those dot phrases for you guys to utilize um, the NAPLA fibrosis score so that you can re-stratify them. You know, in my mind, this is almost something like when you have the diabetic who comes in and, you know, you need to make sure they went to go see the eye doctor and make sure they saw the foot doctor. Well, if the patient is obese, you should just plug in a, a NAPLA fibrosis score on them real quick. And if they're at low risk, they don't need to come see us. You can see them again and calculate it again in another year. 
But if they have an inter, uh, indeterminate score or an advanced score, then they should come see us um, or have a fibro scan to quantify um, their fibrosis and fat levels. And then we can, uh, after we do the fibro scan, if we're worried about them, we'll just have them come see us. We'll refer them um, when they come for the fibro scan. Can they be done We don't do them as inpatients. No, uh, we don't. Outpatient. It's just an outpatient. Um, I personally do them. Okay. Nurses do them. Um, they're in all of our liver clinics. Okay. Um, so any site we have, we have a fibro scan available. Um, we take the portable ones to West and to St. Luke's as well. Um, I have clinics, so if you ever want to refer a patient to me, um, all day Thursday at 102nd Street in the CAM. We're moving from the second floor to the eighth floor in January, hopefully. And then I go to diabetes clinic here um, Friday afternoons at the FPA practice. Um, so again, so it's the elevated LFTs, the fatty liver on imaging, and then uh, anybody with multiple features of metabolic syndrome we should think about. So here's my email, and this is my scheduler. Um, this is information, so please feel free to contact me if you have um, any concerns at all or any questions, I'm more than happy to answer that. Okay. That's my last slide. Thank you guys for uh, bearing with me for so long. Any questions, please? Um, so, like, as far as diet, um, you know, the, 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 yeah, so, like, so if you look at the diet data, like, high, low fat diet versus low carb diet. So whichever one they'll stick to. Let's let's be honest. Um, I, I I use so some of the the wording that I use or examples I use when I talk to my patients are you know you can eat salad or spinach every single day for a week you're gonna lose some weight but you will not stick to that diet. So let's figure out um, what diet you can stick to. Let's just work on caloric restriction. But first of all, let's understand kind of what's doing you in. Um, so I'll have them break out their phone and take a picture of every single thing they put in their mouth. Um, for a couple days so that they can understand how much caloric intake they actually have and then work on reducing it. And for some reason, when you when you're putting, you know, sometimes you just do mindless eating, but if you actually have to take your phone out and take a picture of it, it makes you think about it. Um, I had a patient who had, um, had F3 fibrosis, kept gaining weight, and I had the luxury of time. So I sat down with her for an hour and a half. Um, I, was, I was called to go do a quick exam on her when I was a fellow. Um, and I sat down with her, and we found out it was sweets for her. That was her thing. Was that she she will have the healthiest meals, but she would just do herself in with these horrible sweet tooths she had. So we started working on it. We tried to find alternative things. Um, she tried Halo. I don't know if you guys ever had Halo Top ice cream. It's pretty damn good. Uh, and it's low calorie. So I told her about that. And just, just that little change and just becoming more attuned to things, taking pictures. She lost 55 pounds that year. She still emails me. And thanks me. She cursed me out the first day. She's like, "You're, you're. I'm not gonna do any of this stuff." Then she started realizing she should do it, and she. I kept seeing her when she would come back, and she, so that was the one success story I had. But it's really about caloric restriction. Well, so far, so one big success story so far. Um, I'll also inform them that it takes time for the message to go from the stomach to the brain that they're full. I call it the buffet effect, right? When you're at the buffet, you're eating, and all of a sudden it hits you. Um, so another strategy is to to eat dinner, and while you're eating dinner, halfway through, take a break. Take a 20-minute break halfway through your meal and then ask yourself, am I still hungry? I'll tell you what, I've been doing that myself, and I'm realizing I'm not that hungry. I've lost 15 pounds since I moved here in July. Just by doing that, I'm not working out at all. So <laughs> it really works. Uh, caloric restriction really works. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's why I asked for the water, right? <laughs> um, that's actually the first thing I tell the patients to cut out soda. It's those, it's those empty calories and juices, right? And this is what we tell the diabetics. So I'm a, I'm a basic science guy, too. I've worked on mouse models for years. Um, and uh, when I went to VCU, I worked on mouse models for fatty liver disease and NASH. So we were giving the mice a high, a high fat diet. They would all get obese and get some fatty liver. But it was hard to get, for them to get NASH. So then we added high fructose corn syrup to their water. Nowhere near as much as that's in the sodas you guys are drinking. And ripped.